This is the video for Chapter 5, and in this chapter, we combine the methods of descriptive statistics presented in Chapter 2 and 3, and those of probability presented in Chapter 4. We're going to use both of these together to describe and analyze probability distributions. Probability distributions describe what will probably happen instead of what actually did happen. They're often given in the form of a graph, a table, or a formula. Before we get to talking about probability distributions, first we have to understand the concept of a random variable, and we have to be able to distinguish between discrete and continuous random variables. In Chapter 5, we will focus on discrete random variables and discrete probability distributions. In Section 5.2, we'll be talking about random variables. And in this section, we'll talk about the concept of a probability distribution. And this is just something that gives the probability for each value of a variable that's determined by chance. And we will want to look at how to distinguish between outcomes that are likely to occur by chance and outcomes that are unusual in the sense that they're not likely to occur by chance. Some of the key concepts here, the concept of random variables, how they relate to probability distributions. We want to distinguish between discrete random variables and continuous random variables. We'll develop formulas for finding the mean, variance, and standard deviation for a probability distribution. And we'll determine whether outcomes are likely to occur by chance or, or whether they are unusual in the sense that they are not likely to occur by chance. First of all, a random variable is just a variable. And like any variable, we usually represent this by an x, but sometimes we use other letters that has a single numerical value determined by chance for each outcome of a procedure. So the variable in this case represents all the possible values for the outcomes of an experiment or procedure. Here's an example. An experiment consists of rolling a die and recording the results. So the set of possible outcomes, or the sample space as we learned in Chapter 4, is the set 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So if we were talking about a random variable, we would say x is the random variable, and the possible values of x are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Now back in chapter 1, we talked about the difference between discrete data and continuous data. We have the same type of thing with random variables. We'll be talking about discrete random variables and continuous random variables. So these are basically the same definitions as we talked about in Chapter 1, only they're for variables and not just for data. So a discrete random variable has either a finite number of possible values or a countable number of values. And countable just means that there might be infinitely many possible values, but we can count them. And a continuous random variable has infinitely many values and those values can be associated with measurements on a continuous scale without gaps or interruptions. Remember how we talked about continuous before? That meant that we could have anything within a certain range of numbers. It's the same for a continuous random variable. Now a probability distribution, this is just a description that gives the probability for each value of the random variable. In other words, for each possible outcome of an experiment. And again, we often express this in the format of a graph, a table, or a formula. For an example, let's go back to the experiment that consisted of rolling a die and recording the results. x was our random variable. Possible values of x were 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And assuming that the die is fair, each outcome, or each value of x, is going to be equally likely. So the probability of each one is 1 6. If we were going to construct a probability distribution for this experiment in table form, it would look like this. On the left side, we have x at the top. And then underneath that, we have listed all the possible values of x. On the right side, we have p of x, which stands for the probability of x. And for each one of those values of x, we've listed its probability. For this experiment, all the probabilities are the same. They're each one-sixth. But we'll see other probability distributions where the probabilities for the different values of x are different. That was a probability distribution in table form. We can also make a graph to represent a probability distribution. 
In some places you'll see this called a probability histogram. The only difference between this and a relative frequency histogram is that the vertical scale is going to show probabilities instead of relative frequencies. Notice along the horizontal axis we have the different possible values of x. On the vertical axis we have the probabilities. So for example the bar that's going up from the number 10, the height of that bar would show the probability of that particular outcome. Now the requirements for something to be a probability distribution. First of all, if we have it listed in table form, on the right side where we have the probabilities for each value of x, those values have to add up to 1. We have to include all the possible values of x and the probabilities of each, and all of those probabilities together have to add up to 1. The other requirement is that each individual probability for each individual value of x has to be something between 0 and 1. It can be 0 and it can be exactly 1. What this means is that it can't be negative number and it can't be something more than 1. And this is only for the probabilities, not for the x values. So if we have a table like this, we have some different values of x given and some different values that say they're probabilities of x, we could determine whether this would be a possible probability distribution by seeing if it meets those two conditions. So the second condition we talked about was that all the probability values had to be between 0 and 1. So if you look at these probability values, there are no negative values and there are no values that are greater than 1. So that condition is okay. But if we add up the probabilities underneath the P of X, they actually add up to 1.168. That's not equal to 1, so that means this would not be a valid probability distribution. Now I will show you some formulas to compute the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation of a probability distribution. Really the only one of these that we're actually going to be computing is the mean, and I'll show you how to do it in a table form. But I'll show you the formulas for computing the variance. You can get the standard deviation from the variance. So there are two formulas for the variance here. One of them says it's a shortcut. But again, we're not going to use those two formulas anyway. And here's the standard deviation that you would take the square root of the variance. So to actually find the mean of a probability distribution, if you have it in table form, the first thing you're going to do is add a column to your table. And what you're going to do in that third column is you're going to, in each row of the table, you're going to multiply the x value times its probability. And you'll put that result into the third column. It's going to look like this. So in the third column, we have x times p of x. For example, the first one is 0 times 0 0.13. So we just take each one of those and do each one of those multiplications. And then to get our mean, we add the results in that third column. So if we add up those five results in the third column, we get 1.62. And that is our mean. We don't have to do anything else. We don't have to divide by anything. So our mean for this probability distribution would be 1.62. Now the round off rule for the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation are just like the ones we talked about before. You round the results to one more decimal place than the number of decimal places used for your values of x. For example, if the values of x are integers or whole numbers, then you would round your statistics to one decimal place. With probabilities, we have what we call a rare event rule. And this rule says that if we have an assumption, such as the assumption that a coin is fair, the probability of a specific event being observed, such as something like 992 heads in a thousand tosses of a coin, if that probability is extremely small, then we will conclude that the assumption is probably not correct. And in this textbook, when they talk about a probability being extremely small, what they're saying is that it's less than 0.05. Or another way we could say that is it's less than 5%. That's what qualifies in this textbook as being an extremely small probability. So how do we use probabilities to determine when results are unusual? 
we would say that X successes among the N trials is an unusually high number of successes if the probability of X or more successes is less than 0 0.05. And that 0 0.05 is the same number we were just talking about. And X successes among N trials is an unusually low number of successes if the probability of X or fewer successes is less than 0 0.05. We also need to talk about expected value. The expected value of a discrete random variable, we use a capital E for this, and it represents the mean value of the outcomes. And if you notice, the formula for this is exactly the same as the one for finding the mean of a probability distribution. And that's because it is the same. The expected value is the same as the mean for a probability distribution. Before we look at this example for expected value, let's talk a little bit more about what expected value actually represents. What it represents is that if you conducted the same experiment many, many times, then the expected value would be the average value that you would expect to get for your random variable x. Now when we talk about conducting an experiment many times, we're talking about at least a thousand times, maybe ten thousand times, maybe a hundred thousand times. So if we took, say, ten thousand trials of an experiment and averaged all of the values of x that we got on all those ten thousand trials, that would be our expected value. And the way this works is that the more trials you do, the closer your actual average value of x should get to that expected value. Okay, now let's look at this example. We have a contractor who's considering a sale that promises a profit of 38,000 with a probability of 0.7 or a loss due to something like bad weather, strikes and such of 16,000 with a probability of 0.3. The question is, what is his expected profit? So in other words, the chance that he's going to make a profit, he's saying, is 70%. The chance that he's going to lose money is 30%. So his expected profit would be the average that he would make if he had the same situation over and over and over. Now, how do we figure this out? Well, we're going to create a table of the probability distribution. We want to include all of the possible outcomes and their probabilities. And in this case, we only have two possible outcomes. Either he's going to make a profit of 38,000 or he's going to have a loss of 16,000. Once we have that table of the probability distribution, then we'll just find the mean of the probability distribution since that's the same thing as the expected value. Here's what our table would look like. Notice that for the profit, of 38,000, that's a positive number, but for the loss of 16,000, to signify that it's a loss, we have to make that a negative value. It's okay to have a negative value for the x, because x is the random variable, it can be any value whatsoever. It's the probabilities that can't be negative. So we have our two possibilities, and the contractor gave us the chances for each one of those two, so we have those as our probabilities of x. Now we just need to find the mean for this probability distribution, so we're going to add another column to the table, multiply the x value times its p of x value, so we have our two values there, and then we'll just sum those to get our expected profit, which would be $21,800. This means, again, that if he repeated the same situation many, many, many times in a row, and the average profit he would get for each repeat of this situation would be $21,800. That would take into account that about 70% of the time he would make the profit of 38,000, 30% of the time he would have a loss of 16,000. It would average all of those together. Let's look at section 5.3 on binomial probability distributions. Now in this section, we'll look at a basic definition of a binomial distribution along with the notation for it, and we'll talk about some methods for finding probability values. 
Binomial probability distribution is one where our outcomes can only belong to two categories, such as acceptable or defective, or survived or died. Now, to have a binomial probability distribution, it has to meet some very specific requirements. The first one is that the procedure has to have a fixed number of trials. And the trials have to be independent of each other. Another way to think about this is that the outcome of one trial can't affect the probabilities of any of the other trials. Each trial must have only two outcomes, so the outcomes have to be classified into only two categories. We usually refer to these as success and failure. And the probability of a success has to remain the same in each trial. This goes along with number two, where the outcome of one trial doesn't affect the probabilities in any of the other trials. So the probability of a success can't change as you go along. Here's some examples. In the first one, we have a bag of M&Ms with a certain number of different colored candy. The procedure is going to be that we select 10 candies from the bag with replacement and each time, we record the color of the candy selected. Is this a binomial experiment? First of all, when we talk about with replacement, that means that we're taking a candy out of the bag, recording the color of the candy, and then we're putting the candy back in the bag before we select again. That's what with replacement means, is that we're replacing the candy. So does this meet all the conditions to be a binomial experiment? It does have a fixed number of trials, because it has 10 trials. So we have 10 trials, and since we're selecting with replacement, that means that our trials are independent. Now what about our third condition that we could only have our outcomes classified into two categories. If we're recording the color of the candy selected each time, we actually have five different colors that we would be recording. So the five colors means there are five possible outcomes for each trial. That doesn't meet our condition number three. So this one would knock it out of being a binomial experiment. So no, it is not. Now let's look at the second example. Here we have the same setup. We're still selecting 10 candies from the bag with replacement, and we're recording the number of red candies selected. Is this a binomial experiment? Well, since the only difference here is that we're recording the number of red candies selected, what does that change? We know we've got the 10 trials and we've got with replacement, so those two things are okay. If we're recording the number of red candies selected, that means that all we're going to be recording on each trial is whether the candy was red or not. That means we're only recording two outcomes. Our two outcomes would be red or not red. That would meet condition number three. So if these three met, that means that we would have a binomial experiment. Now let's look at our third example. Here again we have the same setup. The only difference between this and the second example is that we're selecting 10 candies from the bag without replacement. So what does without replacement do? What that means is that if we select one candy, since we're not replacing the candy, that means that the next time we have slightly different numbers for how many blue, brown, yellow, red, and green candies there are. The probability of success is going to be different for each trial. It means the probability of success changes as we go along, and that one doesn't meet our fourth condition. 
So that means that this would be a no. Our notation for binomial probability distributions. And this is important. Our two possible outcomes we talk about as being success and failure. So P and Q will give us the probabilities of success and failure. So if we talk about the probability of success, that's going to be a small p. The probability of failure is going to be a small q. And since we only have the two possible outcomes, the probability of failure is going to be 1 minus the probability of success. So as long as we know the probability of success, we can always find the probability of failure just by subtracting from 1. Let's go on with our notation. We know we have to have a fixed number of trials, so n is going to stand for the number of trials. x is going to be our random variable. It's going to give us the number of successes in n trials. That means our possible values for x will be any whole number between 0 and n, and it can be either 0 or n also. Small p is going to be the probabilities of success in one of the n trials. Small q denotes the probability of failure in one of the n trials. And a capital P that stands for probability of x is going to be the probability of getting exactly x successes among the n trials. Let's look at an example. This is the same M&M's example that we looked at before. This is the one that did qualify as a binomial experiment. So first let's think about what we would consider a success in this experiment. And when you're looking at an example like this, you can decide for yourself what you want to be a success and what you want to be a failure. Usually in one like this, we tend to pick the more positive type of outcome as a success. But again, that's up to you. So we could consider a success in this experiment that we pick a red candy. That means if we pick this for our success, then the event that would be a failure is that we pick a candy that's not red. Remember, we can only have two possible outcomes. So the success and failure have to be complements of each other or opposites of each other. Now, what will our random variable x represent? We were just talking about this with our binomial experiments x is going to be the number of red candies or successes out of our 10 trials. So, and what is the n for this experiment? Well, that's how many trials we have, and since we're selecting 10 candies, that would be our n. Now, how would we find the value for p, which is the probability of success? Well, to do this, we have to go back to what we learned in Chapter 4. P is the probability of success on any one trial, which is the probability of getting a red. So the number of red candies is 12, and we would have to divide that by the total number of candies in the bag. If there are 103 candies in the bag, and I just got that by totaling up all the numbers of the different colors of candies, then this would be our p. We could write that in a decimal form also if we wanted to. And then how would we find q? Well, q is the complement of p, and that means if we have 103 candies, if 12 of them are red, it means all the rest of them are not red. So there would be 91 that would not be red, we would divide that by the total number of candies. So that would be Q. You could also get Q by just taking our P and subtracting that from 1. And to check this, our P and our Q should add up to 1. Now, some important hints in dealing with binomial probabilities. Be sure that the X and the P both refer to the same category. Once you decide what you're defining as a success, then your x is going to stand for the number of successes, and the p has to be the probability of success on any one trial. So they both have to refer to the same outcome. We do have some times when it doesn't really matter whether we sample with or without replacement because our population size is so large. We can 
kind of forget that rule and consider our events to be independent as long as the number of trials is less than 5% of the total population. So the lowercase n stands for the number of trials, or for example, the number of people selected for a survey. The capital N stands for the population size. So as long as our number of trials is less than 5% of our population size, then we don't have to worry about whether we're sampling with or without replacement. Okay, this is one of the most important parts of this video, and I really want you to pay attention to this. I love for you to go find help from other people, tutors and so on, but if they start trying to get you to use the long formula for the binomial probabilities, please tell them that in this class you're supposed to use technology or a table. So method one in the book is a binomial probability formula. I'm not going to talk about how to use that formula. You don't need to learn it. The ways we're going to talk about are either using technology or using a table. So using technology, you can use StatCrunch, and there's a binomial calculator on there. You'll see this when you do Tech Assignment 3. And what you have to do is put in your N. So for example, if we're trying to find a probability for three successes, in five trials, then we'd have n equal to 5, p, which is our probability of success, equal to 0.7, and we're trying to find the probability that x is equal to 3, or exactly 3. So in StatCrunch, you put in the n, you put in the p, and then you have an operator that you can put in here an equal to, a less than or equal to, a greater than or equal to, and so on. And then this value is the one that you want for how many successes. This one, since we want exactly three, we're going to make this an equal to three. And then you just click on compute and it gives you the probability. And it even draws you a picture of the probability distribution. Now if you're using a TI-83 or 84, then it has a function actually it has two functions that do binomial probabilities. If you're trying to find a probability for an exact number, like in this case when we're finding the probability that x is exactly 3, then you use the binomial PDF. And you put in the n first, and then a comma, and then your probability of success, and then another comma, and then your x value. So notice we got the same answer from both of these. Now let's say that we wanted to find the probability that x is 3 or fewer. Another way we could write this is that x would be less than or equal to 3. In that case, to use StatCrunch, we would have to replace the operator over here with the less than or equal to, and then click on Compute. And to use our TI-83 or 84, then we would use the binomial CDF function instead of the PDF function. The CDF function here always gives, for whatever number you put in here for x, it always makes that a less than or equal to. So even if you want something else, if you want a greater than or equal to, you have to find another way to find it, because this will only do a less than or equal to. So if this is what we're looking for, then we would use the binomial CDF and put in, again, our n, our p, and our x, with the less than or equal to, and then that would give us our value. You can also use Excel to find binomial probabilities. And for Excel, you use a function. To get a function, you start out by typing equal sign into the cell. And then it will give you a, a list of different functions you can use. But if you just type in this function, binom dist, standing for binomial distribution, and in this one, you put in the x value first, and then the n, and then the p, and then either a 0 or 1 here to tell you to tell whether you want it to be cumulative or not. This kind of corresponds to what we had with the TI-83 or 84, whether it were PDF or CDF. So if this is a 0, that corresponds to the PDF function on the TI-83. That means that it's going to give you the value of exactly x. 
the x that you put in here. So this value down here is the same one we got from StatCrunch and from the TI-83 or 84 using the binomial PDF function. Now if you want something, like here where we had x is less than or equal to 3, then you'd put a 1 here instead of a 0. So this is comparable to the binomial CDF function on your TI-83 or 84. And this works just like it does on the calculator, and that is that it will only do a less than or equal to. If you want something different, then you have to find another way around it. Now the third method it talks about in the book is using a table. And tables are okay. The problem is that they only have a limited amount of room for tables, so they don't have very many different p-values in them. So we can only use them in very specific situations. But here's one where we could use it. If we had a binomial experiment with n equal to 12 and p equal to 0.8, then we could find the probabilities for exactly 4, exactly 5, exactly 6, and exactly 7 just by looking them up in the table. So if you look in your table in your book, this would say up here that n was equal to 12. And then you'd look down at your x values. You'd find 4, 5, 6, and 7. And these values here would just be your probability. And notice also that you have to pick the right column for the p-value of 0.8. So let's look at it, finding a probability in two different ways. If we want to find the probability of x successes in n trials, Given that the probability P of success on a single trial is 0.2 for n equal 12 and x equal to 5. What that means is that we've got 12 trials. Our probability of success on any one trial is 0.2 or 20%. And we're looking for the probability that x is exactly 5 or exactly 5 successes. So using the table, we would just look up under n equal to 12 and we go down to where x was equal to 5 in the p equals 0.2 column and the value we would find there would be 0.053. Now to use StatCrunch, we'd open our StatCrunch data editor and then go to Stats, Calculators, Binomial. So we'd put in our n equal to 12 here, p equal to 0.2 here, and then we do have to put in an equal sign since we want the probability of exactly five successes. And then we put in our five here. And then we would click on Compute. We get the same answer here that we would from the table approximately. Now let's look at Section 5.4. This is about the mean, variance, and standard deviation for the binomial distribution. And these three statistics are important characteristics of a distribution. They tell us about the center, about the variability, and about the shape of the distribution. The nice thing about a binomial probability distribution is that these three statistics are all very easy to find. The formulas are actually easy. So here are our formulas. For the mean in a binomial distribution, all you have to do is take the n, which is the number of trials, times the p, which is the probability of success on any one trial. You just multiply those two together. The variance is n times p times q, and remember that the q was the probability of failure, so that's the same as 1 minus p. And for the standard deviation, it's just the square root of the variance. So you take n times p times q and hit, then take the square root of that whole thing. So back to our example with the m and m's. We have our binomial distribution where we're writing down whether we select a red candy or not. We have 10 trials. So let's find the p, the q, the n, and the mean and the standard deviation for this probability distribution. So our p is our probability of success. So that would be probability of getting a red candy on any one trial. And we figured out before there are 12 red candies in the bag, and there are a total of 103 candies. So we could leave this in fraction form or write it as a decimal, but this is our probability of success, our p. q is going to be 1 minus that, or we could say this was the probability of not red. 
So it's actually 1 minus our P. And that would be 91 over 103. Our N is the number of trials. So since we're selecting 10 times, that would be 10. So now to find our mean, That's just n times p. So that would be 10 times 12 over 103. That would give us 120 over 103. And again, we could put that into a decimal form if we wanted to. Our standard deviation. Sigma is the square root of n times p times q. So we'd have the big square root over 10 times 12 over 103 times 91 over 103. So to finish this calculation, we can multiply on the top the 10 times the 12 times the 91. And on the bottom we would have 103 times 103. And remember when you're doing something like this, you want to do all of these calculations underneath the square root first. The square root is the last step. So be sure and remember your order of operations when you're doing this. Now let's look at one more example. We've got our same bag of M&Ms. Okay, so the probability of getting exactly two red M&Ms, that would mean that we want to have x equal to 2. Since that's what exactly 2 means. So we would still have n equal to 10. Our p would still be 12 over 103. And our x would be 2. So to put it into our TI calculator, we'd use the binomial PDF function because we're looking for exactly two. So we'd have 10 trials. Here's the decimal value for 12 over 103 is 0.1165. And then our x value would be two. Now for the probability of getting fewer than three red M&Ms, fewer than three means either zero, one, or two. So that would be the same as saying x is less than or equal to two. So to put it in our calculator, here we could use the binomial CDF function. Again, we'd have 10 in our probability of success. Then notice here we put in 2 instead of 3 because the calculator uses the value, the number we put in as the top value. So it has to be something that x is less than or equal to. And finally, the probability of getting at least 7 red M&Ms. Well, at least 7 means either 7, 8, 9, or 10. So this would be x is greater than or equal to 7. We could find this with StatCrunch by putting in a greater than or equal to as our operator. If we want to use our calculator, then we'd have to use the complement because the calculator will only do a less than or equal to. The complement of 7, 8, 9, or 10 in this case is anything from 0 up to 6. So we'd find the probability of x less than or equal to 6 and then subtract that from 1. And to find our probability of x less than or equal to 6, we'd use our binomial CDF function with 10 as our number of trials, our same value for p, and 6 as our number for x. So we'd put that into our binomial CDF function and then we'd subtract that value from 1 to get our final answer. Now remember what we said about the range rule of thumb several times. Values are unusual if they lie outside of our maximum usual or minimum usual values. In our M&M's example, since we found the mean and the standard deviation, the maximum usual value would be 1.2, which was our mean, plus 2 times 1.0, since 1.0 was our standard deviation. So our maximum usual value 
for the number of red M&Ms would be 3.2. The minimum usual value for the number of red M&Ms in 10 trials would be negative 0.8. So in this example, getting four or more red M&Ms out of the 10 would be considered an unusual result.